Hello everyone, Jean Messi here from Our Own Devices, and I have some really interesting and exciting news to share with you. So, as some of you know, over the past two years or so, I have been involved in a large research project on the Nuclear Detonation and Fallout Reporting System, or NDFRS. Now, I've covered this in more detail in two of my previous videos, link in the description. But briefly, NDFRS was a network of around a thousand small fallout shelters called Fallout Reporting Posts, or FRPs, that were built across Canada in the early 1960s in order to monitor and track fallout across the country in the event of a nuclear war. And over the past two years, both by searching through archives for historical documents, as well as traveling around the province hunting down surviving fallout shelters, I've effectively become the world expert on the NDFRS system, and I'm hoping in the future to write the definitive book on the subject. But in the course of my research, I came across the railway museum in a small town in Manitoba called Miami. And this railway station used to have, back in the 1960s, a Type B FRP, the cylindrical type that's buried in the ground. And it was intended that the station agent would also operate the FRP in case of nuclear war. However, just like all the other uh, NDFRS shelters that were operated by the railway, CN and CP, it was torn out and demolished in the early 1970s. But this got me to thinking, wouldn't it be cool to find a fallout shelter somewhere else, excavate it and move it to the museum and set it up as a display just as it would have been in 1963? And so I approached the curator of the museum with this idea. And at first, I thought this was rather far-fetched and out there. You know, this would be a project that either a small museum wouldn't be interested in, or if they were, they really wouldn't have the budget to carry out. But to my surprise, the curator was immediately on board, and so was the entire town who offered up whatever resources they could spare to make this project happen. And so we immediately started looking for an FRP that we could excavate. And first, we went for private owners, thinking, you know, these, these things take up a lot of space. Uh, the owners would be happy for us to pay to remove them and take them to the museum, clear their land, and, you know, we would credit them as the donor of the shelter. And so this is what we tried with a shelter that we found in the little town of Stead. And while the owner was at first enthusiastic, unfortunately, he immediately got greedy and wanted to charge us thousands of dollars in scrap metal value. So we quickly abandoned that avenue. The second shelter that we tried to get our hands on was up at a place called Hollow Water First Nation. And interestingly enough, this one was already out of the ground. It had actually been excavated in 1963 when NDFRS was cancelled in order to make way for the school. And it had just been lying there in the woods for 60 years. And this would have been perfect because all we'd have had to do is drive up a crane in a flatbed truck, pop it onto the truck and drive it away. No excavation needed. Unfortunately, communications up in that area are pretty spotty, and I wasn't really able to stay in constant contact with the owner, so that option fizzled out as well. So instead, we next decided to contact the provincial government, the Parks Department, because we knew that in many cases, they really wanted these things gone because they're out in the middle of the woods and they're afraid that hikers are going to climb into them and get injured or get stuck. And so we found two that were available, one at Big White Shell Lake and one at Moose Lake, which is actually one of the very first FRPs that I ever tracked down and investigated in my studies. And we decided to go for the one at Big White Shell Lake and we almost had all the agreements in place and the permissions, everything we needed, we were about to excavate and then some higher up in charge of that district caught wind of this and said, no, absolutely not. You need a lot more permits and other permissions. There's a lot more paperwork that needs to be done. This is way down low on our priority list, and we're probably not going to get to it for a year, if not two. And so they quickly put the kibosh on that. Thankfully, however, the person in charge of the Moose Lake district was far more enthusiastic about rushing this along. And after a couple of months, we finally got all of our permits and permissions and um, inspections for uh, any electrical lines going through the area, uh, forestry, conservation assessment, things like that. And so we were ready to excavate. The problem was we had to wait after the excavator, who thought this was also a low priority job, and kept putting off the excavation for other contracts. And so summer gave way to autumn, and we we're into October when at the end of October it snowed. And we thought, okay, well, this is it. The ground is going to freeze soon. It's going to be impossible to excavate this shelter. And so we're going to need to wait until next spring. 
But then an interesting thing happened, which was the temperature in November kept hovering at around zero degrees Celsius, giving us a longer window in which to excavate. And we also found another excavator who agreed to excavate the shelter on short notice for a certain amount of cash up front. The museum was able to afford it, they had the money in their budget, and they immediately went for it. And so, on November 14th, we headed out to the Moose Lake site to excavate the shelter. And you couldn't have picked a better day. It was plus 10 degrees Celsius, sunny, no wind, just magnificent. And even better, the soil at the site was just sand, so it proved incredibly easy to excavate the shelter. Indeed, the whole process took only around four hours. And so as you can see in this footage, the first thing they did was to remove the few trees on the site and then scrape down the mound that had been built up over the shelter. And this was to add shielding against fallout accumulating on top. And then they removed the top part of the entrance shaft, which was bolted to the lower part with a flange. So all they had to do was cut off all the bolts with an angle grinder, and it popped right off. And this made the whole thing a lot easier to transport. Then they started digging down around it. And I really have to give credit to the excavator operator here because he was a real artist who was really in control of his machine. He was able to do a lot of delicate excavation around the shelter without ever touching it once. Just magnificent work. And as they kept digging, we made a number of interesting discoveries. Uh, the excavators actually found a Pepsi can that dated from the time that the shelter was buried, the early 1960s. So it must have been left there by the workers who originally put the shelter in place. So I thought that was really cool. We also discovered something that hadn't shown up on any of the blueprints I was able to find in the archives, which is how the shelter was secured down into the ground. They actually had stakes with a cable running over top of it so that if the ground flooded, the shelter wouldn't just pop to the surface like a submarine. But the most amazing discovery of all was just in what good condition this shelter actually was. You can see here, there is almost not a spot of rust on this entire thing. The thing is shiny. It's heavy galvanized steel, of course, but you would think that after being in the ground for 60 years, it would have rusted more than this. But thankfully, since it was buried in sand, the water would just drain down around it and never accumulate long enough to result in a lot of corrosion. And so this thing looks like it was buried last year, not 60 years ago. And so this was super exciting. We could not have hoped for better. And as you'll see by these pictures that I took when I first investigated this particular shelter, the inside is in really good condition as well, with very little rust and just a little bit of peeling paint. So it should be really easy to restore when the time comes. So here you can see them removing the ventilation stacks. These will be reattached at a later point. Once they cut the top off, then the bottom elbow joint just screwed right out. You would have thought that after that many years in the ground, it would have rusted shut. But no, it's still freely threaded out, which was another bonus. And even better, the two lifting lugs that were used to lower the shelter into place back in 1963 were still in incredible condition. So we're able to use these to lift the shelter out. So we just looped some chains through, connected them to the excavator bucket, and out it came. And it dropped nicely onto the flatbed truck. They were able to put some shoring timbers underneath the bottom of the entrance shaft and tie the whole thing down. And yeah, the whole process could not have been neater. And so we drove out and transported this thing all the way across the province and pulled it off of the truck, dropped it down beside the museum. And so this is where we were going to restore it and put it on display. Now, actually putting this shelter on public display is going to present a number of challenges, the main one having to do with accessibility. These shelters are only designed to be accessed through that narrow vertical shaft. And unfortunately, this is a real safety hazard. You can slip, fall, and really injure yourself inside that shaft. And also, it reduces overall accessibility. People with mobility issues won't be able to access the interior. So what we're going to do instead is to cut a full-sized door in the opposite end of the shelter that is wide and tall enough to accommodate most visitors and allow you to just walk straight into the interior of the shelter. And in order to preserve the look and design intent of the shelter, rather than burying it underground, we're instead going to build a big earth and sod mound over top of it, which is going to cover the bottoms of the ventilation shafts and the entrance tunnel. And while NDFRS was never activated and none of these shelters were ever equipped with their radiation detection equipment or survival supplies or anything, just to give an idea of 
what the shelter would have looked like had the system gone active, we are going to equip it according to the official supply list. And I've actually accumulated most of this equipment, including the remote radiation sensor, all of the blankets and cooking equipment and communications equipment, and basically everything that would have gone into one of these. So when you walk into this shelter, you'll be able to feel what it would have been like to be an NDFRS volunteer and have to stay down in one of these things for two weeks while you reported radiation levels every hour. I think it'll be a really unique experience and it will be a unique display. There are no other shelters of this type on public display anywhere else in Canada. And I'm really excited to get started on the restoration and exhibit building phase of this project. Uh, right now, because it's winter and there's really not much we can do, we are simply in the planning phases of trying to figure out how we're going to get the door cut, how we're going to get electricity into the shelter to get it lit, how we're going to build the mound and everything like that. But once the snow melts in the spring, the real work will begin. And hopefully by the end of that summer, or maybe the summer after that, depending on how things go, we will have a truly unique display preserving an obscure but fascinating piece of Canadian Cold War history. Anyways, that's all I have for you today. I just wanted to share this exciting news. I've been waiting for months to actually get this thing excavated and be able to tell you about the project. And now I can, and I will update you on it as often as I can over the following year or two. Anyways, I'll see you next time on a regular video. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.